Well, we're, we're starting off a, a new series today, and as we do, uh, I begin thinking about how interesting language is. It's interesting how language changes over the years, and that language defines culture. Uh, I didn't live in the 20s, surprise, but I uh, was looking at some, uh, some phrases, and one of the phrases I had heard before but didn't realize where it came from was in the 20s, uh, that that's the cat's pajamas. Have you ever heard of that? Right? That's such a weird phrase. Right? But it just means that that's the best. Right? Um, you have in the 60s, you have groovy, which is cool or excellent. In the 70s, you had catch you on the flip side. You guys remember that? Yeah? Okay. And uh, that just means see you later. In the 80s, which is one of the greatest eras and had some of the, the greatest words uh, that ever came out, bodacious. Uh, meaning beautiful or gnarly, uh, meaning that that's exceptional. I remember in California, I was working with uh, teenage boys, specifically uh, seventh and eighth grade boys who were surfers and skaters. They had their own language. And so going in, I had to figure out what that sick means, um, right? You had to learn the language and that the language would define the culture there. Uh, even today, we, we still slang words come up. Now, not only do we have spoken slang words, but now we have a texting language. Um, I have to often go online and search what things mean. Uh, parents, I would encourage you to do that. If, you're, uh, if your young people have a, a phone or they're texting at all, uh, they have this language that defines their culture uh, right now. Language defines culture. And language is always changing. I don't know if there's someone sitting somewhere in a basement who comes up with a word and they plug it into the, to, into the, the culture and it slowly spreads. I don't understand how it happens. But language defines culture. And so what, what I want us to see today and for the next couple of weeks is there is a word or a phrase that I often say that I have began to believe that most of us don't really know what it means that we talk about the kingdom or the kingdom of God, but most of us are a little clueless on what that, that means. I think it's not something that's often been talked about in the church. I, I've spoken with people who have been in the church for a really long time, uh, 30, 40, 50 years, and they would say that they had never really heard about the kingdom coming, about the kingdom being here and now. And so we want to spend a, a few weeks uh, looking at this. And I believe, I believe that this is central to God's plan and purpose. That the kingdom of God is central to God's plan and purpose. And even as I say the word purpose, that's an interesting word, right? That I don't know about you, but for me, there have been times in my life when I begin to wonder, uh, what, what is my purpose? What's my purpose? I don't think that's just a thing that teenagers uh, question, but I just think that for many of us, we, we sometimes get to a place in our life where we begin to wonder, well, what is even my purpose in life? And so we, as we begin to think about, well, that's God's purpose. How does that play into my purpose? And, and for most of us, I think we just exist. We just exist. Uh, every day kind of looks the same. We have the same routine. Uh, you know at certain times you should be doing certain things in the morning as you get ready for work. You, you have your routine. You have it down. And I just think sometimes we just exist. We, we get up, uh, we, we go through our, our day, we go to bed, and we get up, and it's the same thing over and over. And we begin to wonder, what is this all about? What purpose do I have? And I think not only do we begin to look at purpose as we think about the kingdom of God, uh, but I also think it's this invitation to a new reality. Because I know that some of your realities right now are overwhelming to you. I know that there's hurt, and I know there's brokenness, and I know there's pain. I, I know there's things that were unplanned that were happened. I know there's things that you would want for your life or you hope for your life, but you're just not experiencing or seeing. And what if, what if God's kingdom was this invitation to a new reality? That life actually could look different for us. That there's this different way <clears throat> of doing life. And so we're going to look at this word kingdom specifically, and then specifically the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven and, and asking and inviting the kingdom to come. See, we, we talk about the church a lot, 
Uh, and when I, when I talk about the church, I think by now, if you've been around here and maybe you're new, I'm not talking about a building. Uh, the word in the scriptures is ecclesia, so an assembly of people or the called out. And I don't know if you know this, but ecclesia or the word church only appears two times in the Gospels. Uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the accounts of Jesus' life, the word ecclesia happens twice. And we put so much effort and time into how we do church or what the church looks like, but, but would you just know that the kingdom, the word kingdom is in the Gospels 121 times. That the kingdom of God is a central point to what God is doing, to why Jesus comes. Uh, if you own a Bible, uh, I would actually, uh, and you brought it, I'd have you pull that out. If you have a smartphone, uh, I, I would ask you to look through scripture as we, we do this. I think it's important for you to see that this isn't what I'm saying, uh, even if I put it on the screen, um, but, but you actually tangibly can see it. If you don't own a Bible, there's a red one around you somewhere. Please take that. That's our, our gift to you. But it's interesting, in the Gospel of Mark, um, there'll, there'll be a page number that comes up with this. And if you own a Bible, sometimes the, 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 the words of Jesus are in red letters. So in the Gospel of Mark, the first words we have Jesus saying are about the kingdom. <clears throat> so Mark 1, verse 14, it says, After John was put in prison, John was one who was pointing to Jesus. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. Jesus comes and begins to proclaim some good news. And if you've been around church, we've also understood that the idea of good news or the gospel being what Jesus does for us, what God has done for us is the good news, right? So we see that he's coming proclaiming the good news of God. And then verse 15 says, the time has come. He said, the kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. So it says he comes proclaiming the good news. Well, what's the good news that Jesus comes proclaiming? He's saying that the kingdom of God is at a point where you can almost feel it. it it's, it's so near to you that it's no longer just something that's out there. That God is not somewhere else and we hope that he intervenes, but that God comes near to us. And in coming near to us, in Jesus coming, the kingdom of God comes. And what Jesus says after that is to repent, to see things differently, to see that there's a new reality to life. To repent is to turn. You, you were headed one direction and you thought one thing and then you turn, you, you repent. And then you believe that, that what you believe actually comes out in how you live. So the kingdom of God, this purpose and this reality is being made known because Jesus has come. And the kingdom of God is where the purposes and the ways of God are made apparent. This is important. So as we talk about the kingdom, when the kingdom comes, we see the ways of God, the rule of God, the reign of God made apparent here and now. So we see justice happen. We see freedom take place in individuals' lives and for people that are oppressed. We see healing. We see mercy and forgiveness rule over bitterness and resentment. This is the good news that Jesus comes proclaiming, that the kingdom is, is near, that those who are once far from God can be near to God. This is the kingdom of, of God. Now, this isn't an escape the kingdom of God is not about escaping from an evil world when we die, but it's about an announcement that God's eternity, that his love, the kingdom of heaven has moved in, right? The, the, the big word for this is incarnation, that God took on flesh and dwelt among us. That again, that God isn't just out there somewhere, but he comes near to us here and now. And so the church... Ecclesia, the assembly, the followers of, of Jesus are committed to this good news of God's kingdom in the world. And we see areas of in, the, in our world and we see the things that shouldn't be. Right? As a follower of Jesus, you should be aware of the things around you if you are. And I know not everyone in here is. 
And I don't even think you have to be. See, I think that's often the things that makes us begin to wonder and question. And, and I think we have a couple of options. I think we have a couple of options. When we see bad things happen and when we wonder why pain exists, we can do a couple of things. We can wonder, well, why does a loving God allow that to happen? Or we can begin to believe that a loving God cares so much about it that he doesn't just escape from it, but he enters into it. And there's an invitation as followers of Jesus to enter into it as well. That as followers of Jesus, we enter into the pain of others. That we walk alongside people as they mourn, as they grieve, as they hurt. That we see where there's oppression and racism and prejudice. And we see where people are taken advantage of. And we, we do something about it. We speak up for it because God has entered into it and the kingdom of God has come near. And if it's come near, then we too as followers of Jesus want to see the kingdom come and we begin to ask ourselves, well, what do I do? What role can I play in the kingdom of God? See, it was an invitation. Uh, have you ever um, been invited to something where it kind of overwhelmed you? Like there's someone, you got invited to a, a meal or to an experience and you're like, I, I can't even believe I get to to do that. I have some friends who have invited me to come and, and to go to the masters here in a, in a couple of weeks. Um, and, and, um, that, that they are helping it take place. Cause like, I would never be able to do that, yeah. right? I would never be able to go, but for them to say, we are inviting you to do this yeah. and you become overwhelmed. Have you ever not been invited to something? Like in our social media world, you see the party or you see the thing happen and you're like, oh, my invitation must have gotten lost in the mail somewhere because uh, I'm not in those pictures and I don't get to be a part of that. And so here's the beautiful thing is that we're all invited. We're all invited to be a part of something way bigger than us. We're invited to be a part of this new reality where God enters into our world and then he invites us to be a part of it Listen, there's a scripture that, that many of you may know, and if maybe you haven't been in church or you don't know the scriptures well, you've probably been at a funeral or you've been somewhere where people have invited you or prayed the Lord's Prayer. In Matthew 6, uh, starting in verse 9, the followers of Jesus, they see what Jesus is doing and they basically say, hey, can you teach us how to pray? We want to have power when we pray and we want to connect with God when we Pray, And so Jesus begins to teach them. And I'll just look at the very, very first part. It says, uh, this then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, how would be your name? Recognize the, and, and be in awe of who God is. And then the, the, the next part, verse 10, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It's an invitation to begin asking God to bring his kingdom into our world and into our lives, that, that God wants to move into those areas. And then he asks us to pray for it. I don't think Jesus is inviting us to pray for something that couldn't happen. Right? I don't think Jesus is saying, hey, pray this. It's never going to come true. But what, I'm only going to teach you one way to pray. And this is a part of this prayer. But, but just know that it, it really won't happen. No, I don't, I don't think that's the case at all. I think Jesus actually means when you begin to pray that the kingdom of God would come in your broken relationships and into the hurt and pain, I actually think the kingdom of God can, can come. That, it, that, that the up there, some way that people, ref, that people refer to the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven is that the up there, we often think of heaven as being, being up there, that the up there would come down here. Right? The, the longing of our heart for everything to be perfect and, and there to be no more sickness and no more pain, that, that we begin to pray that the things of heaven would, would come into our, our lives and into our world. And Jesus invites us to pray that. And so the invitation to this new life and into this new reality, specifically as followers of Jesus, is not that, that we'll just squeeze a little bit of Jesus into our lives. Uh, not that we get a little bit of Jesus and, and we're like, yeah, that'll do for now. And we go about our, our daily lives. But, but I think this invitation into this new life, into purpose, into a new reality is that Jesus totally revolutionizes how we live. That we don't see our lives as our own anymore. 
that our goal as followers of Jesus is that we are always pushing for the kingdom to come. That we are always praying for it and we are always asking what can we do to help it come. And so our hope is that the kingdom, the ways and rule of God would break into our hearts, that we would see ourselves differently, that we would see God differently, that we would see one another differently when the kingdom breaks into our heart, that it breaks into our lives who we're living for, what we're living for, what gives us purpose and meaning, how we find our identity. And it moves out into the world around us, that we help bring hope into a hurting world around us. Uh, Jesus has this encounter with some of his closest followers, and, and they're the, really one of the most important questions that we hear Jesus ask is found in this, and I think it's a question that he asks us as well. Uh, Matthew 16, starting in verse 13, it says, When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea of Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say the Son of Man is? So there are always these crowds coming and listening to Jesus, and the disciples would catch wind. And so Jesus is wondering, those crowds who come and the crowds who are being fed and those who are coming to be healed, who do they say that I am? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. They would see that good things were happening and they were wondering who Jesus was, but instead of really knowing who Jesus was, they just thought he was a prophet who had come back. Someone who was pushing for the future, who was talking about the, the future. And then Jesus asked this question, verse 15, but what about you? What about you? Who do you say I am. And then Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. He's saying, you're, you're the one we've been waiting for. Uh, you're the one who is going to come and rescue and redeem and save us. You are the Messiah. And Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man, but by my father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. Verse 19, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Who do you say that Jesus is? Like, is he just someone who's a teacher and you're like, I'm just going to kind of live my life by some of the ways that he teaches. I think he was a good person. I think he did some good things. Or do you believe that Jesus is the one, the only one who can rescue us, redeem us, and save us? That he is the one that we have been waiting for. Do you believe that? Like, does it move into every area of our lives when we do? And when Peter says who he is, then Jesus' response is, I'm going to build my church on you. The assembly of people is going to start right here on you, and I'm going to, the rock, right? And that, that nothing can overcome it. And then he says, in doing that, I'm going to give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven, uh, Heather and my daughter, so my wife Heather and, and my daughter Kennedy, they went on a school trip this last week to New Orleans. Uh, they came back on Thursday. Their bus driver got hit by a car uh, moments before they were supposed to leave. So it kind of threw them off a little bit on the, the day. And I had to leave a car for, for Heather. I had to leave her the keys. And so they were coming back at like two in the morning. And so I had to drop the car off and I, I hid the keys and I took a picture and I sent Heather a picture of where the keys were, were at in the car. And I didn't have an extra house key. And so I had to hide a, a house key at my house. And so I took a picture of where I hid the keys. And if on my phone, I can take a picture and I can mark on it. I don't know if, if you use a phone, if you know that. And so uh, we had a, a stone. And so I marked on it a, a star and I said, here's the key. And, and I slept on the, the couch that night until they got home. I couldn't sleep real well. And so my dog starts to, to bark and I, I walk outside and my wife and, and my daughter are like searching for the, the key. And she's like, I can't find the one you wrote on with chalk, right? I didn't make it clear. I, I didn't make it clear to Heather that that wasn't really chalk on a stone. It was just the, the picture. But what was happening was I was trying to give her access Right? She could not get into the house without a key. She could not get into the, the car without a key. And what Jesus is saying is, I'm giving you access to a kingdom. I'm giving you access to a new way of living life. And the only way that we have access to it is through Jesus. And that we believe who Jesus says he is. And so he's giving access to this, this new way of living 
life, that we can live out the kingdom in our daily lives. That the kingdom, if you are a follower of Jesus, this is what we stand upon. Again, that the church and what we are doing together is so important, but, but what we're doing is for the kingdom of God. It is the foundation. This is what Jesus often talked about was the kingdom of God. Uh, I, I was probably at the end of my, my high school uh, days and some, some friends of mine, we went to a uh, small lake to spend the day and, and my friends at one point said, hey, we're going to swim across the lake. I don't know if you've ever been in this situation. It's always farther than it looks. And you're like, oh yeah, no big deal. I can, I can swim across that. But for me, I wasn't a very good swimmer. And so everything in me said, don't do it. Uh, don't do it. Don't, don't get in the water. Don't even start the, the swim. Um, and I did. And uh, I gave in to, uh, to peer pressure as we began to swim across. And I get about three quarters of the way across. And I really thought I was going to drown. Uh, my friends had swam off and left me. And I begin to tread water. And I am not a good swimmer. And so I don't know if you've ever been in a place where you felt like you're going to drown uh, and you begin to become anxious and, and you don't swim normal anymore. And I begin to go under. And the amazing thing is when I went under, my feet touched the ground. And I never, I never realized that just below me was the ground. Never realized it. So I feel like I'm going under and I put my feet down and I stand up. And I stand up in the water. And as we feel like we're drowning, listen, I, I know the reality for many of you because you tell me, and I can't even imagine the reality for some of you because you haven't shared with me. The pain, the disappointment, you feel like you're drowning, you have no purpose. The reality you find yourself in is not the one you wanted. And you're reaching out and you're trying to figure out what do I do in the midst of all of this hurt and pain? And what I'm encouraging you to do is just stand on the foundation of the kingdom of God. That hope is there. Hope is here for us. That it's not one day, right? That the kingdom of God will be fully experienced after this life. But there is an invitation for us to experience the kingdom of God here and now. Right When Jesus comes and he proclaims the kingdom of heaven, he begins to do things. See, Jesus didn't come just to die for us. Uh, if he did, he w wouldn't have needed to live for 33 years. Right? He could have come as a, a six-month-old and they could have given his life as a six-month-old, but Jesus comes and he lives this life like no one else had ever lived. He lives this perfect life. And what Jesus is doing with his life is he is pointing to the kingdom and at the age of 30 is when we finally see or know about Jesus beginning to do ministry. And for three years, Jesus is pointing to the kingdom. And he's forgiving people for their sins, but he's, he's also healing people. He's giving glimpses of what the, the kingdom of heaven is like. So he heals people of disease and disfigurement and dysfunction. He brings about wholeness to every dimension, not just spiritually, but physically emotionally, relationally, Jesus brings the kingdom and he points to the kingdom with his life. And this is what he's telling us that we have access to. And all kinds of people are drawn to this. All kinds of people are drawn to this kingdom. Um, I don't know if you know this, but, but the church doesn't have the best reputation all the time. What's interesting to me is that the cred of Jesus and what people think about Jesus is good. I've never had a conversation with anyone who has bad things or, or, or ill feelings towards Jesus. But the problem is that the followers of Jesus often have the, the bad reputation. But people are okay with, with Jesus, so much so in the, in, the, in the scriptures that Jesus spent so much time with the wrong people, what people would have considered the wrong people, that the people begin to call him a drunk and a glutton. Because Jesus' kingdom is moving into all areas of his world. And so people come and they want to be near to Jesus. And so the church, especially in America right now, is, is not necessarily growing. That people are a little hesitant to, to step into a church building, to become associated with the church. I want to show you just a, a quick graph, uh, just doing some reading and, and research. Um, most um, 
people who study this kind of thing say 80 years ago, that would have been kind of the pie graph of who was connected to a church, who attended a church on a, on a Sunday morning. Um, the next one, it flips. And they said in the 1980s, the, the numbers of people who were in the church and out of the church just kind of flipped. And then in the early uh, 2000s, um, that they begin to say about 20% uh, begin attending or was still attending church on a Sunday morning. And they're projecting in the year 2020 that about 4 to 6% will go to church, a church service on a Sunday morning. Now, for, for many people, this becomes depressing and discouraging and we feel overwhelmed and we begin to feel like it's us versus them and we, we speak poorly about culture. But here's what I would say. We have an unbelievable opportunity. We have an unbelievable opportunity to no longer expect just a service or a time on Sunday mornings for that to be the time where people experience the kingdom of God. That if people are going to experience the love of God, it's going to be us living out the kingdom of heaven. That we have an unbelievable opportunity for people to wonder what the church is about, to have feelings about what the church is, to be interested in Jesus and wondering about purpose and looking for a new reality, and for us in our lives to live out the kingdom. To no longer wait for people to to even come to us, but we live in such a way that we point to the kingdom of God. And so we produce this fruit in our life, and we talk about this often, that there's love that is produced in our lives, that we actually love people, and we love our neighbors, and we love people who are far from God, and we love people who live in ways that we think uh, are wrong or we don't agree with, that we actually love them that we care about their needs and their pain, and we move into those areas, even if they look different, live different, or believe differently than we do, that we actually love, that that we have a joy to us, right? That as followers of Jesus, we should be joyful people, that there is a peace to us, that we are patient people, that there's kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. There is a picture of the kingdom in our lives. So in your workplace, you have an opportunity to bring the kingdom of heaven into your daily work as a, as a teacher and how you treat kids and how you point to the kingdom and how you uh, interact with kids' parents and coworkers and how you do business and you don't cut corners and you do what's right, that your word matters, that the things that we do in our our jobs are not meaningless. You're nine to five or whatever that looks like for you and you get up, don't don't just see it as a way to make money, as a way to punch a clock, as a way to do something. It is an opportunity for the kingdom of heaven to come into the people's lives that you work with. In your neighborhood, in your own home, the kingdom of heaven goes with us where we go. I think something could happen in our lives and the lives around us when we put into practice what we believe about God's kingdom. That it's not something that people will eventually experience, that we hope at some point they follow Jesus and that when they die, they experience it fully. But there's an invitation for people to experience the kingdom of heaven now, that we want the kingdom to to come. I want to end with a a, a story in Luke 5. In Luke 5, um, Jesus has uh, come. He's called his first disciples. He's calling people who wouldn't have been invited uh, at other times to follow a rabbi, which is what Jesus was. Uh, Jesus gives this invitation uh, to be a part of something to to some, some disciples. He heals a man with leprosy. And then we see this, this moment where Jesus is teaching and there's so many people in a, in a house. It's, uh, uh, un, um, there's, there's no more room for anyone else to come and experience what Jesus is doing. Let's, let's look at it, verse uh, 17 in, in chapter 5. It says, One day as he was teaching, Pharisees and teachers of the law who had come from every village of Galilee and from Judea and Jerusalem were sitting here there. And the power of the Lord was was present for him to heal the sick. So you have all these religious people who often were coming to trap uh, Jesus. They're wanting to hear what Jesus is saying. They don't really believe in Jesus. And then in the midst of that, you have people who are being 
healed. It says, some men came carrying a paralytic on a mat and tried to take him into the house to lay him before Jesus. Okay, so um, this is where I'm going to take a little bit of freedom and, and imagining. I wonder if it was the person on the mat who wanted to go to Jesus. Like, I wonder if the person on the mat was so tired of being on the mat, he just didn't believe there was another way. That the person on the mat, the, the paralytic, just thought that that's how life was going to be for the rest of his life. Like, he had heard Jesus was doing things, but he, he knew it was going to be impossible to get to Jesus, so he just kind of felt like this was his story and his reality and that there was no other way. And then there's these friends. And, and I like to believe that these friends had heard about Jesus and that the, the kingdom of God was coming and moving and people are being healed and, and there was something about being near to Jesus. That they saw a new reality for their friend when their friend couldn't see it for themselves. And so they, they pick up the man on the mat. Can you get this picture of these friends carrying a paralytic on a mat? And he's like, no, 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 no. It's, it's not worth it. It's not going to work. This is my life. I, I, I'm, it's not going to matter if I get to Jesus. And then they get to Jesus, right? Verse 19, it says, when they could not find a way to do this because of the crowd. So they get there. There's a barrier, man. We, we want to get you to Jesus, but I just don't know a way. They, they could have just turned around and thought, man, this is probably your reality. When they could not find a way to do this because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and lowered him on this mat through the tiles into the middle of the crowd right in front of Jesus. Just get this picture. They can't get in. And so somehow these four friends lift their paralytic friend up on the roof of the house. They, they get him up on the roof of the house and they literally begin to tear apart the roof of the house. Like uh, uh, tar, that, that whatever is used to, to, to secure the roof of a house, they literally begin to tear it up and a little light, right? You're now, put yourself inside. You now see a little light come from the roof. And then they open it up and you have these four friends and a paralytic looking down at Jesus. And they lower Jesus down in the middle of the room. Verse 20, it says, When Jesus saw their faith, he said, Friend, your sins are forgiven. I don't understand this scripture. I'm just going to be honest. This is an interesting scripture to me because when Jesus says this, he says their faith. Right? That it wasn't even necessarily just the, the paralytic man. But it, maybe it was the faith of the friends. Maybe it was the faith of the friends who believed in a new reality for their friend who couldn't get there on his own. That the barriers of being paralyzed, the barriers of not having a way, the barriers of not getting in, these friends found a way for him to make it to Jesus. And in this moment, we see that his sins are forgiven. And so we could stop there. We could stop there. And for us, that is a big deal. We want people to understand that their shame, their regret, the, the things that they wish they wouldn't have done, the, the, the brokenness in our life, in their life, we want them to know that there's forgiveness. And we could quit here and we could celebrate what happened in this guy's life. But then you had the religious leaders. Verse 21, it says, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law began thinking to themselves, who is this fellow who speaks blasphemy? Who can forgive sins but God alone? And then verse 22, it says, Jesus knew what they were thinking. <laughs> I love this. Uh, I, it's not that he heard them. He just, he just knew how they were. And so he steps away from the scene and he walks up face to face, eye to eye with those who are questioning. And this is what he says. Why are you thinking these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralyzed man, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. See, the kingdom came in this guy's life in more ways than just forgiveness. Uh, he caught a glimpse. He caught a glimpse of the kingdom of God and how it changes his life completely. Verse 25, it says, Immediately he stood up in front of them, took what he had been lying on, and went home praising God. Everyone was amazed and gave praise to God. They were filled with awe and said, We have seen remarkable things today. Now, 
he do, that they don't say what, what I'm going to say, but I wonder if they could have said they have seen the kingdom come today. They had seen remarkable things take place. Forgiveness of sins, that someone has the power to speak life into someone, to say that everything you have done is forgiven, and then the reality of this guy being paralyzed for a long time. In a moment, everything changed because the kingdom of God had come near. And so, as I said earlier, there is an invitation to you and to me to be a part of the kingdom of God coming in other people's lives. So the barriers that other people have to coming to follow Jesus, that maybe that barrier is coming to a service on Sunday morning, you bring the kingdom of God to them. You love them in such a way, you, you perform good deeds in such a way that they begin to praise your Father in heaven. That they see you live a different life, that they see you live out what you say you believe. And when we do that, I believe the kingdom of God comes near to them. And just maybe, just maybe they would begin to believe that they would have their own faith and there would be a forgiveness of sins and there would be a, a new reality in their life. And so just, just quickly, and I'm not going to spend much time on these, uh, a few questions for you. Have you experienced the kingdom of heaven in your own life? Have you believed that there is forgiveness and that you're loved and that God has come near, that God isn't up there somewhere, but he has come near to you in the midst of your pain? Do you believe that you can have freedom over the struggles in your life? That not only is there forgiveness, but there is power over the temptations, over the sins, over the struggles, over the addictions, that the kingdom of God comes into your life for forgiveness and for wholeness. And if you have, or maybe today is that day, and you haven't been baptized, would you do that? Um, next Sunday, we're going to baptize. We just baptized some people and I had some more people come to me and say, hey, can we, can, can we have our kids be baptized? And so next Sunday, Palm Sunday, we're going to baptize a couple people. If you haven't been baptized, can I encourage you to be baptized? That you publicly proclaim that the kingdom of God has come near to you. And so right after this, if you have it, just come talk to me. Um, if during this week you, you feel a, a stirring in your heart that you've never been baptized and you want to be baptized, you can, in that bulletin that you got, you can contact us. But don't wait. That baptism is not this moment where you reach a point where you can be baptized. It's not that you get all fixed and then be baptized. It's that you have been made clean, that you are experiencing a new reality, that the kingdom of God has come near to you, and the, the proclamation or the response to each other as the church is that has happened. Um, and, and maybe you've done that before. Um, and the next question is, are there places in your life that are not under the rule and reign of God? That it has been this idea that there's just been a little bit of Jesus in your life. That, that your finances, your relationships, how you do your work, how you treat your neighbors, what you think about people, has the ways of God moved into every area of your life, into your heart, and into your mind, and into the way you live your life? If not, Begin to ask God to do that. And then some really practical things uh, leading into next week's message. Uh, who can you serve this week? Uh, who can you walk alongside that is just needing a little bit of help? Uh, whose kids could you watch? Who, who could you take a meal to? Who needs a conversation? Who needs to be prayed for? Uh, who can you serve uh, this week? Uh, pray that the kingdom comes. Right? Pray that the kingdom comes in someone's life. Actually believe that it could happen and pray that the kingdom comes in someone's life around you and that it comes into our community. That every week when we receive the offering and the money comes in and I say, may the kingdom of God come. May the ways of God come into your life and into my life and into our community. What I'm saying is, would we use what God is giving us? the resources that we have? Can we help bring this reality uh, here and now? And then the last one, as sensitive to people, and Greg can come, as sensitive uh, as people are to come to a church service, Easter is a time when people will come. That, that if you just invite. I'm not looking for you to invite someone who goes to another church and that you're trying to bring them here. I I'm talking about people who normally on a Sunday morning don't attend a church service. 
Maybe they went to church a long time ago. Maybe they've been hurt by the church. Uh, would you invite them? Would you just personally invite them to come and to celebrate and to be with the church and that maybe they would catch a glimpse of the kingdom of God here and now? Not in the future, but a glimpse of a new reality here and now. Would you stand as we sing? I'm going to pray for us. Um, and then we will sing together. God, I pray that you would um, help us to believe. God, we pray that your kingdom come. I pray for my friends who are in broken relationships, that their marriages are struggling. I pray that your kingdom comes there. I pray for those who are addicted, who feel overwhelmed. I pray that your kingdom comes. I pray that we would begin to believe that you could use us, that you give us purpose and that we can actually help other people experience your kingdom. God, would you give us faith? Would you help us to personally experience your kingdom in this new reality? Give us purpose to our lives, that everything we do, and everything we say, and everything we think points to your kingdom. Pray in Jesus' name.